Roof here from securingthestack.com. We're just continuing our Linux architecture discussion. And last week we were talking about um, memory access schemes. And the most predominant of those is virtual memory. And we're going to be going into that today. So it's a memory access scheme. And virtual memory is implemented using hardware and software. And what's the idea behind it? So it maps virtual addresses, okay, in other words, memory addresses used by a program to physical addresses on the on the hardware. And from a processes view, virtual address space is just a continuous chunk. So all of the from from a program's point of view, it has all of this memory allocated to it and it's all just one blob. Uh, and we'll we'll see why that's useful. And hey, I'm the only process on the machine, is what the, the process is thinking. So how does this virtual physical translation occur? So let's look at this picture. So the virtual memory, OK, per process, right? So all of its virtual addresses that are available to the program to store uh, things in, in RAM, all just look like a continuous portion of memory. And those, through virtual memory, this memory access scheme, are mapped to particular parts in physical memory or locations. Each of these are actual locations. So this location is being mapped to this, etc. And you can see that through this memory access scheme, multiple processes, uh, uh, processes can share the physical memory, although it just looks like it's just one continuous space for the program, which is very important as we kind of talked about right, you know, last week about, hey, why do we need a memory management, you know, kind of uh, like a scheme? Why do we need this, this memory access scheme? And we talked about the downsides, you know, the downsides being, hey, what a headache that would be for a developer, you know, to have to look at all of these spaces and see is somebody else, is another program utilizing it? And what's if there's, you know, namespace collisions? What's if, you know, different people are trying to access the same, you know, piece of memory at the same time? That's just a huge nightmare. So virtual memory to the rescue. <laughs> okay. And, and also, I just want to say, going back to this, this thing about the disk, we'll be talking about that very soon. But for now, just kind of, just ignore it. <laughs> so... The MMU, the memory management unit, that resides inside the CPU. And this has to deal uh, with the, this virtual uh, memory. Uh, essentially, with all this vi virtual memory stuff, uh, that MMU is, is pretty much uh, implemented in every single virtual memory system. So the, the, the MMU is inside the CPU. In general, the kernel maintains a page table. I've already kind of alluded to this. And what that page table does is it maps a process's virtual page address to a physical address. Okay, so it's just a mapping file. Each page has a single page table entry, so a PTE. Okay. Each PTE has a page user bit that specifies if a page can or cannot be accessed from the user space. So this is essentially what we're kind of talking about, you know, at, um, you know, when we were, we were discussing privileges um, and it kind of uh, what, you know, code or what CPU instructions can essentially access what. One thing I do want to say is just just remember that the pages are, are pretty much the, um, you know, the kernel creates pages, right? And it just, it, just to kind of remember, because I know this course is spanning multiple weeks, what is a page? And the page um, is, you know, the kernel creates this, creates pages, okay? And a page is the smallest unit of memory in a virtual memory operating system. Okay, so it's like the smallest atomic unit. Uh, you can kind of think of it that way um, in virtual memory operating systems. And, you know, we were speaking about, okay, each page table entry has a page user bit, okay? And this is the foundation of sandboxing, which is very important. Also, remember our discussion on how only ring 0 and 3, you know, were, were utilized out of all of the rings available? That's because a page table entry only has two levels of permissions. 
okay and it is believed as we're seeing right here two levels of permissions and that is it is believed that is why there is only two corresponding rings in Linux right so that's kind of kind of a cool food for thought now let's keep diving into it the translation look aside buffer and this is housed inside the memory management unit and it caches recently use, used PTEs and then once the PTE is cached the page can be accessed like physically accessed now do the actual pages need to be loaded into memory at all times and it's just something to kind of think about no all right and let's let's learn on demand paging so essentially what what's kind of going on and we're going to go into more of this like uh, the, this caching and stuff like that i'm just kind of foreshadowing a little bit here but one thing in life is is i love the 80 20 uh i think it's called uh, the 80 20 rule i don't know if it's called the 80 20 principle or the 80 20 rule but it nevertheless um it's that 80 20 rule okay says it's just kind of this 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 golden ratio in, in a certain way is, is applied to a lot of areas in life and it's kind of a general rule of thumb and in this context it could really point to 20 percent of the resources get utilized 80 percent of the time okay so think 2080 instead of 80 20 <laughs> all right just another way of saying it so in general we don't need all the pages loaded at once so that's where on-demand paging comes in okay so what happens is is the kernel generally generally loads and allocates pages as a process needs them on demand paging okay so let's just say a new process is executed what happens so the kernel loads the beginning of the process's instruction code into pages okay and the kernel may allocate some working memory pages to the new process as the process runs Okay, so let's just, now we're, we're at the running step. I know there's a million steps that can kind of occur between this, but let's just for simplicity's sake. As the process runs, there might be a point where it tries to access a page via a virtual address that isn't physically loaded in main memory. A page fault is then triggered by the memory management unit. Okay, it's just like a, a little flag that's thrown. Then the kernel is going to take over, and the kernel is going to load the necessary pages into memory and gives control back to the process. Okay. So what if all processes RAM needs, right? So all the processes in general is greater than the system RAM. Well, that's why we have paging. Okay, and this, and that's really what's going on right here. And really, I mean, this picture is oversimplified, and essentially, this is moving um, kind of, you know, actually, I think we can just go a little bit more further. Yeah, here we go. I'll just go ahead and describe it a little bit more here. So the kernel moved pages from memory to the disk swap space, right, to expand the process's memory. And it also, paging in general, also handles the disk to memory process. So here's the thing. So, yeah, you know, I mean, this picture right here is a little oversimplified, and that is just because the process doesn't directly access the disk, right? Um, the swap space, in other words. Um, the, the, the page is loaded into memory in, or into RAM, right, from the swap space first, and then it is utilized by the process. So this is a little oversimplified, but I think we get the picture. So do we need paging if system RAM, okay, is greater than all processes RAM needs? So say we have enough system RAM to cover everything. Do we need paging? And just think about, I don't know, would we need it into the future as some kind of a safeguard? Well, the thing is, is yes. I mean, and, and the interesting thing about how things are implemented at a low level is a significant number of pages referenced by a process early in its life may only be utilized for initialization and then never used again. 
it is better to swap out those pages to disk before our RAM demand grows. Okay, and this is just good housekeeping. And as we've seen, paging can occur when a page fault is triggered by the MMU. And let's just kind of explore various uh, types of page faults. So the page fault types. So we have the minor page faults. And this occurs when the desired page is in memory, but the MMU just doesn't know where it is. Okay, And this can occur if the MMU doesn't have enough space to store all the page table entries. Solution. Okay, So the kernel informs the MMU about the page's location, and the process will continue. Not a big deal unless super crazy maximum performance is needed. So we checked out minor. Let's let's look at major. Major page faults occurs when the desired page isn't in main memory at all. Kernel must the kernel must load it from disk, okay, which is much slower storage, and this can lead to something called thrashing. And thrashing is is just essentially it's a performance degre degradation due to constant paging. Because remember, this is the disk is much slower. And also, paging requires heavy kernel computation and other processes are placed on hold while this is occurring. And sometimes this is just unavoidable, right? So you're loading code from disk when running a program for the first time. Now let's kind of, let's, let's look at this. It's kind of interesting. So <laughs> yes, this IP address that you'll see up here, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's an internal IP uh, I'm on on EC2 right here. Um, so no, I'm not a security guy who's giving my EC2's public IP to the world. Um, but what this is doing is I'm basically looking at the, uh, the processes on the system, right? And I'm just looking at their, their minor faults, their major faults, and then just the arguments, right, um, with, of, of invocation. And then I am tailing that by, you know, I think the, the default is by 10 lines, okay? So let's look at it the first time I run this. So there's 115 minor faults, and there's one major page fault. And you can think about that, right? This tail, when I did it, this on the system, was being ran or run for, for the first time. Okay, So it has to be loaded in from disk, right? And that is going to be a major page fault. Now let's do it again. Okay, Let me just wait for this little thing to go away. So you can see at the bottom, uh, the, the, the last line, okay, is uh, that last tail command. We have 113 minor faults and zero major page faults, okay? And, and that's essentially, um, this is the cool thing, and this is because the kernel has a page cache that caches pages that are pulled in from disk. By default, the kernel uses all free RAM as the page cache, but the kernel will still show this memory as free because it's easy to overwrite. Now, we've gone through the kernel, uh, out of that <laughs> good weed, uh, like kind of going through the weeds right here, but in, in a good way. Um, but now we're going to kind of go up to, to the user space. And you know what, actually, for the user space, uh, I think that'll kind of just glide us home to the end of the lecture. So let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll do that one next week. So uh, please tune in and looking forward to, to, to seeing you. Thanks.